about to talk about physiology. And I believe that it's understandable. If it is not, if you're like, wait a minute, I'm not following, raise your hand. Because I really, because really what I'm going to tell you, you've heard this before, you've heard eat better, eat protein, right? Anyone not hear that message, right? Exercise, sleep. We've all heard it, but, but we don't do it because we don't know why it's going to help. So I want to explain why it's going to help. So first we're going to start with you. And, and I like people to think about their energy supply and what it generally runs. And so you can read this yourself and go, oh yeah, usually I run from a 7 to a 5. Or if you say, wow, I usually run from a 5 to a 3. Yeah. That's, that's hard if that's your usual. But kind of notice where you run in general. And then, as I go through the physiology, think about if this might apply, some of these things might apply to you. So when I talk to people in general, what I find is either they skip breakfast, of course we all have coffee because this is the Northwest, and, uh, and then they'll have cereal, a scone, a piece of toast, usually carbohydrates. More and more there are people who know they should get protein in. But we're going to stick with the carbohydrate people for a moment. And what happens when we have sugar is our blood glucose goes up. And then there's this hormone called insulin. And insulin's job is, is like, if you guys are, are all glucose, and I'm insulin, I'm going to come over here. My job is to come up to, this is a cell, go knock, 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 do you need any fuel? And if this cell needs fuel, the door can now open, you guys can flow in here. Right? And so, like, if I pulled you all here, there was, this, would, this would be low in people if we put you all over here. Right? That's what happens. That's why the blood glucose drops. And that, when we have just carbohydrates in a meal, that's going to happen in 1.5 to 2 hours after that meal. And what's going to happen if we are like, if we might get the signal, hey, we need fuel, and we're like, oh, we're not going by the candy jar. Nope. Right? Then the blood glucose is going to continue to drop, and we're going to get an adrenaline hit. Bear's in the room. Bear's not in the room, but your body just panicked because it doesn't have enough fuel. Right? The reason why we like sugar, there's many reasons why we like sugar, but one of the reasons is we temporary, or alcohol, this works with alcohol as well, is we get this hit 20 minutes after eating it that everything's going to be okay. You live in a world where you know everything's not going to be okay. You, you're confronted with that every day, right? And so, and it may not, you may be, you may be okay, but there are people that you're connecting to that you're that you may worry about. And so sugar is going to become interesting. Alcohol is going to become interesting. But every time you do the sugar, two hours later, you're going to get a, an adrenaline hit. For the people that you're connecting to, whose lives really aren't okay, this plays out over and over again. Next question. Yeah. The adrenaline hit is a response to the dropping of the blood glucose. glucose. So what's, what's the adrenaline trying to do? Get you to it, food? It's going to help you make fuel. It's going to help you make fuel. Watch this. That's a great lead-in. Two more slides. <laughs> so this is what we generally do. When I was at medical school, I ate every two hours. Just like, get up, eat food. Eat, get up, eat food. Because like, the information coming at me in medical school like, was full on all the time. right? And I needed the fuel to process. So this is what the adrenaline does for us. So we have declining glucose to the brain. We get the adrenaline hit because the adrenaline is going to go to the liver and help the liver make fuel for our brain. And the liver is going to make glucose, and the glucose is going to go to our brain. It's also going to go to fat tissue because fat tissue is always available for deposit. It's just how it is. <laughs> now, our liver is going to make the, the new glucose out of protein. And the protein is, has only two places it can come from. It can either come from our diet, which assumes that we're eating protein or we have access to protein, or it's going to be coming in from our muscle mass. And muscle mass sets our metabolic rate, 
which determines how many calories we get to eat in a day. But the other thing that muscle mass does is how I understand the body is muscle mass determines a number of really important things. It, dis it determines our physical as well as mental well-being. So our physical well-being, if you have a lot of muscle mass, it is really hard to get diabetes. And statistically speaking, as an American, that, or a pe person living in America, that's what's going to happen. Because we are just exposed to way too many carbohydrates. But every time we move our body, we get brain-derived neurotropic factor, which is a fertil brain fertilizer that helps our body our brain learn faster, so we don't have to be exposed as many times to the information. And it helps prevent dementia, which is the other thing that we're all worried about, right? So I don't know about you, but I want to preserve my muscle mass at all costs, because this is my retirement plan, <laughs> right? But if I'm donating it to my brain every few hours because I'm not getting, I'm not eating protein throughout the day, and I'm getting jacked up on adrenaline, that's not helpful. Does this physiology make sense to you? Does that answer your question? Why, why, why the body like is going, oh, bear the room. It's like, wow, we have 400 emails to respond to, and you know, not enough fuel up here to do that. That's that's a panic. Oh yeah, and muscle mass helps us burn fat mass, just in case you're concerned about that. But we're not here to talk about diabetes and weight gain, we're here to talk about the brain. And so, many ways to slice and dice the brain, but we're going to slice and dice it in terms of the cortex, which is what's responsive, innovative, problem solving, deals with memory, like that's our smart brain. And then we have the middle prefrontal cortex, which is about executive functioning, which is about planning and attention and organizing. If you have teenagers, it's that thing that you're like, oh, I can't wait until it turns on. When there is no adrenaline in the system, all of our sensory input, what we see here, smell, taste, and feel, goes to the top part of our brain. And our brain's like, oh, well, we should make this kind of decision. And isn't this nice? And no problem. And we can take in lots of different facts and decide to go this way. However, when there's adrenaline in the system, regardless of the cause, all the sensory information gets dropped into our limbic system. And our limbic system's first decision is going to be run, fight, you know, or kill it, right? Uh, humans rarely, uh, we, we know fight, flight, freeze. Humans rarely freeze unless they're in, in, currently under attack but I call it disappear, right? And so disappear can be into Facebook, Ben and Jerry's ice cream, alcohol, uh, marijuana, you know, where we're like, this, this, this is my entire world, <laughs> you know? Like, don't bother me, because I'm looking at my smartphone, right? Like, we want to limit our emotional uh, world. Uh, and we see that one, uh, some of you know, know Jason Bragg, who's a parent ally, and he has this great story that when he went to the shelter care hearing, he hadn't eaten in like 18 hours. He was withdrawing, and he put his head on the table, just not that he didn't care, he just couldn't take in information anymore, right? He just needed to disappear. But that behavior to the rest of us means something different, right? So that's, that's how it disappears, shows up in this, this room. Uh, and then uh, reactive uh, past behaviors. Like we will use whatever behavior we've used in the past. So one of my uh, common stories when I'm working with people in early recovery is they will miss a meal, they will go to the grocery store, they will fill up their bag with food, they will get home, they're unloading the, the grocery bag, and there is a bottle of wine. And they don't even remember buying it, <laughs> right? Because this part of their brain is like, I'm in recovery. And this part of their brain is like, well, we go buy meat, and we go buy vegetables, and we go buy, buy 
Oreos, and, and then we walk down the line, and we just pick it up, and like, it wasn't even a decision. Now, the interesting decision comes when it's right there, and, you know, sometimes they pour it down the drain, and often they drink it, and we have a conversation about that. Um, is this making sense? So, recognizing when the lizard's in charge is really important. So, lizard brain is agitation, anxiety, <laughs> irritation. My favorite, anxiety, agitation. I'll talk to you in a second. Uh, agitation, when I am anticipating that, right? Like, oh, that's my favorite, right? Where nothing's happening. Uh, not hungry in the morning. Some of you must know somebody who's just not hungry in the morning. And if you ask them why, they're like, well, I had a big dinner. And I'm like, well, if you had a lunch that big, by 7 o'clock you would be hungry, right? Like, after Thanksgiving, aren't you hungry later in the day? I'm always really hungry later in the day. Um, so the reason why people are hungry in the morning is they actually have already hit the adrenaline button because they've gone too long. Because it's not biologically a good idea when you're actually running from the bear to be like, oh, I'm hungry. I think I should stop and eat, <laughs> right? And so when we have adrenaline in the system, that, that hunger signal gets suppressed. And so somebody who doesn't want to eat, and often this will happen when people are going to high stake events, such as coming to, to court, is they will choose not to eat because they want, I mean, they're not thinking about it this way, but they think they'll survive better by having more adrenaline in the system, which was true 5,000 years ago when you were going to go be at war with somebody or kill a woolly mammoth. That was a good plan, not if you have to talk to a judge. Not a good plan, right? And then 3 a.m. committee meetings. Anyone ever have a 3 a.m. committee meeting? Same thing, like you went to sleep, you had dinner, you may have had a glass of wine with dinner or after dinner, or maybe Ben and Jerry's ice cream, your blood glucose goes up, comes back down, but your brain's not thinking that much, you go to sleep. Your brain has a lot of stuff to do without you, that's why I want you to go away for eight hours, but it doesn't have enough fuel to do that all, so it hits the adrenaline button, and your brain's like, hey! We have adrenaline. When was the last time we had that much adrenaline? And then either you get a PTSD nightmare or you get a committee meeting where you're like, oh, he said it, she said it, I should have said it. <laughs> and, you know, and, and that lasts two hours before you get to go to sleep, which is 45 minutes before your alarm goes off. <laughs> I mean, this shows up in all sorts of really sneaky ways. So what do you do about this? It is stunning to me that my shtick to make a living is to say, eat protein. But that's my shtick. That, you know, everybody's gifted with something to do in their life. And that, there's this <laughs> physiological trick that if you eat protein, you will double the amount of time your brain has to think. That's it. That's like my big thing in life. And, but it works so well. And so what you find is that if you have protein for breakfast, you will have three to four hours in which your brain has enough glucose to just stay in the smart part of your brain. If you're working with somebody with a lot of trauma, they may only have two hours even with protein. Like, I've worked with some people with just really complex trauma, and they're just putting a little protein in every two hours to kind of get that stable, non-adrenaline event. It gets better over time because they've stopped zinging themselves every couple of hours, and so their brain starts to believe that the world's a little safer, right? So part of why this helps is because in order to make neurotransmitters like dopamine and serotonin, we need protein, right? And a whole bunch of B vitamins, but we start with protein. 